Hello there and welcome back to another video. In today's video, I'm going to be building a device that solves a problem I've had for a long time. I use 3D printers quite often in my projects and I have two of them. One of them is an Ender 3 and the other is an Ender 3 Pro, but they're practically the same. And I like to use a Raspberry Pi to run OctoPrint so that I can send files to the printers remotely. But really, it's just nice to not have to fiddle with the tiny micro SD cards. However, if you've ever run OctoPrint before, you know that one of the major issues with it is that the 3D printers have to be turned on for the communication between the Pi and printer to work. And sometimes you might not want to leave the 3D printers on all the time. So I came up with an idea to fix this that has been done before by several other people, but I still want to show off my semi-unique implementation of it in this video. So today, I'm going to be building an all-in-one box that allows me to control the power to both of my printers separately from within the OctoPrint web UI. Also, with the way that I'm building this power control box, you could theoretically use this to control any device that uses a standard IEC C13 power cable. The design process for this was really quite simple, and for that reason, I'm not going to talk too much about it. This design uses a custom PCB to keep all of the electronics nicely organized and to keep the inside of the device from being a rat's nest of mains voltage wiring. The PCB has four relays on it, one for the live and one for the neutral of each of the two separate power circuits that it can control. Then there are just some 2N3904 transistors, 470 ohm resistors, and 1N4007 diodes for the rest of the circuitry so that the Pi's GPIO pins can properly control the relays. Yeah, it's a super simple circuit design. Then I designed a PCB to go along with the circuit that I just sketched up, and I made sure that the traces on the PCB should be thick enough to easily handle eight amps of current, more than enough for most 3D printers. Plus, I kept large enough tolerances between the traces and put cutouts where needed, so that this board should be good enough to handle up to the 240 volts AC mains voltage in many countries outside of the USA, where I am. In any case, I took these PCB files and sent them off to the sponsor of today's video, PCBWay, to have them produced. PCBWay offers many different high quality custom manufacturing services at great prices. If you're into making things, you should absolutely consider checking out their PCB production services, which I'm using in this video, as well as some of their other offerings like 3D printing, CNC machining, and sheet metal production. I've used several of their services before, and the quality they provide is always incredible. Check out PCBWay at the link in the video description for versatile, high quality manufacturing services. In the week that I was waiting for my PCBs to arrive, I hopped into Autodesk Fusion and started creating a full 3D model for the case that I plan to put this device in. Since it does deal with mains voltage, I want to have a good enclosure for this project so that there's no exposed mains wiring. Also, I should mention now, that this project does deal with mains power levels, which if you don't treat with respect, could hurt you or start something like a fire. So copy this project with this in mind and at your own risk. This is the chassis that I came up with. It's not the most compact thing in the world. However, this is by design, as there will be a fair amount of wiring that has to be done between the screw terminals and the IEC sockets. So I wanted to leave enough room to do this relatively comfortably. You can see that there are two male IEC sockets that will accept the 3D printer's stock power cables, and then there are two female IEC sockets that you can plug some IEC C13 to C14 cables into to connect from the box to the 3D printer. Or again, anything that has this standard power socket and doesn't have a current draw in excess of eight amps. Now with the 3D model done and the PCB sitting on my doorstep, it's time to finally get to building this thing. If you're choosing to follow along at home, make sure you also reference the Instructable in the video description for full detailed instructions. I unpacked the IEC sockets, relays, and fuse clips that I had to order for this project, which I provide more info on sourcing in the Instructable, as you do need to get the exact components I'm using here, or they're likely to not fit. Then I unboxed the PCBs from PCBWay. As always, the boards came out flawlessly with no quality discrepancies whatsoever. I then took one of the boards and prepared to start stuffing it with all of the components. I started with the transistors, resistors, and diodes because, well, why not? Then it was time to take care of the screw terminals and the four pin header that connects to the Raspberry Pi. Now, you might've noticed that I used three pin screw terminals in this design, however, only put two holes in the board. 
This is because I modified the footprint of the three pin terminals to turn them into what's basically a two pin terminal with a very wide pitch. I did this because I had these terminals on hand, but liked the extra separation between the wires that doing this would offer, and the only modification you have to do is to fully unscrew and remove the center terminal from your terminal block. Then, the terminal blocks and the 4-pin header can be soldered on like normal, and now, all that's left are the 4 relays and the fuse clips. The fuse clips are easy and are designed to take a standard 5x20mm 8-amp fuse, and the relays are also really easy to solder on. I chose to use these G5Q series relays from Omron because they're actually quite affordable from a name brand, have options that come with 5 volt coils, and are able to switch up to 250 volts AC at 10 amps. Just like that though, the PCB is all done. However, before I continued with the assembly process, I chose to double check that the relays were switching as they should be by plugging in my bench power supply and checking the board's functionality. After all, it will be plugged into mains power, so if it does something weird, it could cause a pretty big problem. Thankfully, everything was fine, so I moved on with connecting and mounting the Raspberry Pi to the board. To mount the Pi to the PCB, you should use a combination of 20mm high M2.5 standoffs and 15mm high M2.5 standoffs for a total height of 35mm. If you have single 35mm M2.5 standoffs though, those will work perfectly. Then, with an additional 4 M2.5 screws and nuts, the Pi can be mounted. However, before mounting it, you should connect the power PCB to the Pi with four female to female JST jumper cables. Connect ground to ground, five volts to five volts, and then P1 and P2 on the power board to any two GPIO pins on the Pi. Just remember which ones you used so that you can set them up correctly in Octoprint later. I then flashed Octoprint to a micro SD card for the Pi, and I'm not going to go through that process because a million other people already have great Octoprint setup videos. But once Octoprint was set up, I logged into the web UI and configured the power control buttons. I'm using this plugin to control the GPIO pins on the Pi with simple buttons in Octoprint. I installed the plugin and went to the configuration page for it where I set up a button for printer one power, which controls the GPIO pin that connects to P1 on the custom PCB, and then I made another button for printer 2's power, which controls the GPIO pin that connects to P2 on the PCB. After that, I tested it by pressing the buttons in the web UI and measuring the continuity between the different terminals on the power PCB, and amazingly, everything was working first try. Awesome. Finally, it's time to combine the brains of this device with the IEC sockets and 3D printed case that make it truly awesome. The first thing I did was mount all of the IEC sockets into the 3D printed case with some M3 screws and nuts, and I made sure to use M3 screws with countersunk heads so that they sat flush with these sockets. Then, I mounted the red PCB into the case with some M3 by 6 screws, and I put the one that's covered by the Raspberry Pi in first, while waiting to put the other three in. This is because it can be a bit of a tight fit to get the Pi in, and leaving only the one screw that can't be put in after the Pi is installed makes it easier to wiggle the board around and get the Pi in, which is what I did next. I then secured the Pi with the nuts and put the other three M3x6 screws into the red PCB. Now all that's left is the wiring between the IEC sockets and the screw terminals. For this, I'm using some 18 gauge stranded wire that I salvaged from an old IEC power cord a long time ago. And if the internet isn't misleading me, this wire should be good for a little more than the 8 amps that this circuit is fused at. As for where each wire goes, conveniently, the live and neutral connections on the IEC sockets are labeled, and on my PCB, I also label where the live and neutral connections should come in and go out. The in connections are from the male IEC sockets on the far outsides of the case, and the two inner sockets are the sockets that the out connections go to. Make sure to use heat shrink on the solder joints to the IEC sockets, and I'd also recommend plugging in cables to the sockets that you're soldering on, because it makes it much harder to overheat the socket and mess up one of the pins, like I sometimes have done when trying to desolder from these connectors. After all of the live and neutral connections are complete, you can use some more 18 gauge wire to connect the earth pins of the two rightmost sockets together, and then the earth pins of the two leftmost sockets together. 
Finally, it's time to test the device out, and I chose to test mine initially with the lid off, but be careful if you choose to do this, as there will obviously be some points in the box where the mains voltage is still live and open, so don't start poking around in there. I used my bench power supply to demonstrate the power socket switching for this first test because the 3D printers are a little large for my set and I didn't want to move one over at the time. Testing out one of the sockets, it worked perfectly as when I hit the button on the web interface, the power supply started right up. Switching over to the other socket, it worked exactly the same, which was amazing to see. So I closed the device up with some more M3 screws and wrapped up this project by cleaning off my 3D printer desk and reassembling everything with this new box as the heart of the system. I plugged in USB-C power for the Pi as well as its ethernet and connected each of the 3D printers to power through the switched outlets on the box. I also of course left the power switches on the 3D printer's power supplies in the on position so that the switching outlets on this new box would actually work. Now, if you're wondering if it's safe to shut down these 3D printers in this way, as it's a hard power cut, I can't speak on behalf of all 3D printers out there, but for the Ender 3s I have, this is fine. This is actually the way that the power switch built into the printer works already, as it just cuts the mains power directly. I lastly connected the two 3D printers to the USB ports on the Pi so that OctoPrint can send prints to them. And here's a tip that I learned a while ago when I was first setting this up. To avoid the USB power from the Pi from backpowering the 3D printer when it's off, put a small piece of tape on the 5 volt pin in the USB cable so that there's no power connection between the Pi and printer, just ground and data. After all of this setup was done, I tested it one last time and it still works perfectly. I've been using this setup for a couple of weeks now, and I can tell you, this is one of the best, most practical devices I've made yet. Well, that's all that I have for you in this video. I hope that you were able to at least enjoy it, and maybe even learn a thing or two. In any case, I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.